Well, this morning, if you'd take your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to the book of the Revelation, if you would. And we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, and I'm going to read from verse number 14 to the end of the chapter. You'll recognize this is one of the letters that our Lord Jesus Christ wrote to seven churches, seven real churches that existed in the first century, toward the end of the first century, and each of the letters was written individually to a church. They didn't have any denominational organization where you could send one letter and everyone would hear it. Uh, that's the way it should be. But here is the letter to the church in Laodicea, and uh, verse number 14 is where we'll begin. If you'll follow along with your eyes as we read the word of God, the Bible says, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, I pray that we indeed, each one here, will have an ear to hear what your Spirit would say through the Word of God to this church, to the members of this church, to each individual that's hearing the sound of my voice today. And dear Lord, I pray that you would accomplish your will and purpose, that you would search our hearts, that the Spirit of God would reveal any wicked way in us, and Lord, as you see us as no one else can see us, that uh, Lord, we might come to realize our situation, our standing before you, and indeed, if necessary, to repent and turn to you. Father, I pray for your blessing on the message, the preaching of it, that you would guide and direct in all thoughts and words that are said. To your honor and glory we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Two weeks ago, I was privileged to be the speaker or one of the speakers at a missions conference in the city of Digos, south of Davao on the island of Mindanao in the Philippines. And ordinarily, when you come to preach at a missions conference, uh, you will find that there is a theme that has to do with world evangelism. And uh, yet the theme for this meeting had me really... Um, thinking and, and perplexed for a little bit. The theme was defending the Bible through doctrine, separation, and testimony. And as I was given that theme, and I'm thinking this is a missions conference, it sounds more like a Bible conference to me. I even called Brother Wally and said, you know, what's going on here? Uh, normally when you have a missions conference, you're going to be preaching on the Great Commission, you're going to be preaching on looking on the fields and white under harvest. You're going to be preaching about faith, promise, giving, and so forth. There's a lot of topics that can be preached. And yet here was a missions conference that had a theme of defending the Bible through doctrine, separation, and testimony. But once we arrived there, and I began talking with the pastor of Bible Baptist Church there, and some of the other preachers that came... I understood why this particular theme had been chosen. And it was chosen because the preachers in the Philippines that attended this meeting, and I'm sure there were others as well, 
they had a great concern about the drift among Bible-believing Baptist churches in the Philippines that were compromising and drifting away from where they once stood. And certainly that ties in with the idea of world evangelism and preaching the gospel because if churches are not going to remain true to God's word, then they're not going to follow God's word and they're not going to uh, preach the gospel as they should to the nations of the world. And when I began to realize why they had chosen this theme for a missions conference, it really just clicked with me because uh, I had previously heard it from Brother Wally. In fact, it was one of the reasons that we uh, and he and his wife uh, emphasized the importance of Bible Baptist publications in the Philippines, Philippines Baptist Outreach Publications Ministry. I remember quite a few months ago, maybe a year or so ago, talking about that with Brother Wally and he said there is such a need here for sound materials to be given out to the preachers because they are drifting. And it was a great concern and this ministry that they have in the Philippines and have left behind and it continues to go is so important. And it was gratifying to hear from many of the preachers how much they use and appreciate the materials that are printed there. Most of them are our materials that are, are printed there and so forth. And, and uh, so I picked up on the concern in the minds and the hearts of these preachers about the compromises that were taking place. But even before I got down to Mindanao, I had fellowship with a, an evangelist who is uh, church planting in Manila. I hadn't met him before, but we had really good fellowship, and he was saying the same thing. And, uh, and of course, as I said, when I got to the conference and fellowshipping around with preachers, uh, they were also voicing that concern. And then I began to think, you know, in this year alone, in the travels that I've made, I saw this same compromise, this same drift in churches in Australia. Uh, so-called independent Baptist churches that I've known for years are beginning to change in different ways. When we went to Fiji earlier this year, it was evident among some of the brethren there that there was this compromise taking place. And, and I've certainly seen it in our own nation here. Churches that once were solid in the faith, standing for the faith and were lighthouses for the gospel are a different kettle of fish. There's been changes that have taken place. And really what I'm talking about and want to talk about for a little bit here this morning is a drift away from the old book and the old faith that's taking place. It's hard to believe, but there's a departure from using the authorised King James Version in many Baptist churches today. It seems inconceivable to me, but that's what's happening. And there's a departure from the historic Baptist principles that uh, we stand for, and there's a drift into more of a Protestant viewpoint of doctrine, such as the rejection of the Bible teaching of what a New Testament church is, to accepting this idea of the mystical universal body of Christ theory that's actually not found in the Word of God. It's a very Protestant idea. Rejecting the authority of a church in baptism. Churches are now receiving people. As long as you've been immersed, it doesn't matter who did the immersing. Uh, that's something that's contrary to the word of God. The rejection of a closed table at the Lord's Supper. Uh, inviting anyone who loves the Lord to partake in the Lord's Supper. And I'm not going to get into the explanation of these doctrines, but they have scriptural grounds for what we believe. And yet there is this idea of, well, you know, we can, we can weaken the doctrine, we can, we can do more, we can see more, we can, uh, we can enjoy things more if we can just not be so hard-nosed when it comes to the Word of God. And... You know, there comes with any weakening in doctrine, as the Bible says, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. So when our doctrine changes, guess what? Our standards change. Our music changes. 
And that's another thing we find in this drift away, this compromise, is that uh, churches are going into the contemporary field. And, of course, the word contemporary is not a bad word. It just means present. But when we talk about contemporary music, we're talking really about the introduction of worldliness into the music. And it's a, an amazing thing, and it's not something that's really new. It goes on in cycles. But, uh, you know, you would be saddened, and I am saddened, surprised and shocked over what is happening. Bible-believing Baptist churches that were once lighthouses for the gospel and bastions of truth uh, are now what we might call contemporary, and their appeal is to the people and the desire to, to fill the pews. Uh, there's a term out there called seeker-friendly. Well, I think we ought to be seeker-friendly, don't you? I mean, we ought to love people. We should not be so hard-nosed that we drive people away, but really our desire is to be truth-friendly and to preach the truth in love. When we do that, God's word will do something in people's lives. And, uh, and you know, I, when I was fellowshipping with some of these preachers, dear men of God in the Philippines, uh, they would ask my opinion, why does this happen? Where does it start? And uh, I thought about it there, and I thought, well, you know, there's a number of things I've seen as to why churches change, why Christians change. Um, sometimes it, it occurs when there's a change of pastors. A pastor dies or resigns or retires or leaves, and younger pastors come, and, of course, they know better. And they're full of ideas, and they want to make changes, and often... Those changes just change the church in the way it is. We, we have many examples in our country uh, of that. It can occur through preacher peer pressure. We read about that in Galatians 2 where, you know, when preachers decide to get together and form fellowships and, and little organisations where they have office bearers and elections, there's pressure that comes to conform to the group think. And as goes the, the body of preachers... Uh, so go the churches. I've seen that happen. It can occur through winds of doctrine that come. Some drift off into Calvinism because it appeals so-called to the intellect. It makes us feel like we're intelligent. We're not just dumb Bible-believing, Bible-preaching people, if you know what I mean. Calvinism is a destroyer of evangelism. It's a destroyer of churches. It'll tear churches up. There's a lot of other ideas out there as well. But uh, all of these changes are happening and it, it just, I think the trip to the Philippines, for me, it just served to, to highlight how widespread this is. We live in this country and, and uh, as a pastor you rub shoulders with other preachers and you hear a lot about what's going on and... and uh, it's a lot of concern here, but going overseas, you find that it's, it's something that's there uh, and is of great concern. Um, but really, it's part of an observable cycle that we see in history that be begins back in the first century. And uh, when you study the history of churches, you'll find that they go from being Bible-believing churches, then they become institutionalized, and then they become denominations, and then they become apostate, and then out of that comes uh, a revival of Bible-believing, and the cycle goes on, and on and on. And we see the fruits of that in the various uh, religions that go under the banner of Christian. Um, I've often said, if you want to see what can happen to a Baptist church, if it goes off the rails, look at the Roman Catholics, because they used to be Baptist once in history. And so we see this in the first century as evidenced here in our text, the church at Laodicea. You'll notice in verse number 20 that our Lord Jesus Christ is outside the doors of the church, so to speak, and he's knocking to come in. Well, that's, uh, that's not how it was meant to be. The Bible says that in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20, and through 22, that a church is built upon the foundation 
of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now we're not talking about a physical building here, but we're talking about the spiritual assembly of God's people, baptized believers, who assemble in this place. And when we assemble, you know what? God is here with us. We don't see him, but we ought to... We ought to um, experience him through the preaching and the singing and all of that but the Lord is this is his church and he dwells in the midst of his people a temple is a dwelling place for God and yet here with this church in Laodicea he's outside <laughs> that's a that's a strange a strange situation when Jesus doesn't show up on a Sunday when he doesn't show up on a Wednesday because he needs to be here. This is all about him. He's the head of this church. He's the foundation of this church. And his word is what this church is built upon. And uh, so these, these drifts and these compromises are more than just something that's acceptable. They're, they're very concerning and ultimately very destructive. In fact, if you read through Revelation chapters 2 and 3, you'll see that each of the seven churches will give us a clue as to how things change. The church at Ephesus, for example, I would describe as a church that was very active. It had lots of things going on. And it was doctrinally sound. They even put people on trial who said they were apostles and were not. They were so right in everything. But you know what? They left their first love. And they left off their first works. That was a church that was so doctrinally sound, as somebody said, it was straighter than a double-barreled shotgun, but twice as empty. That's a danger for any church, that we can become so routine in our ministries that we just get up and do them like robots and we don't have a love in our heart for the Lord. That can be the beginning of a decline. The church at Smyrna was under extreme persecution and I've seen over this last several years uh, particularly with the pandemic where churches were put into situations that they'd never experienced before and the the struggles they had have ultimately led to changes and tr tribulation will do that the church at Pergamos was one that compromised that tolerated the Nicolaitans and false teachers in the church uh, let them come in chapter 2 and verse 14 talks about that the bible jesus rebuked the church he said uh, i have a few things against thee because thou hast them that hold the doctrine of balaam well balaam was one who taught israel to uh, co-mingle to to uh, break down the separation uh, be unequally yoked with unbelievers and that that spirit got into that church and it began to destroy the church. Thyatira was totally contaminated. In chapter 2, verse 20, Jesus said, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication and so forth. This church at Sardis had a name that it lived, but it was dead. <laughs> You know, we, we take the name Baptist, it's a Bible name, and it has a significant, a great significance historically. But just because we call ourselves a Baptist church doesn't mean we're alive. The church at Sardis had a name that it lived, had a historic name that was something that uh, you could look back on as we do on our forefathers and what they went through to preserve truth, preserve the word of God and the truth of baptism and so forth. And we could say, I, I'm, I'm glad to be a Baptist, but listen, putting that on the church sign doesn't mean that this is a church that Jesus owns. And the church at Sardis was dead. It had just a few members of the church that um, had not... Uh, 
had not uh, tarnished themselves. In verse 4, I have a few names, in, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. It lost its purity, but there was a remnant of believers. Now, it's important to keep in mind that these seven churches were churches in the New Testament sense. They were an outgrowth of the church that Jesus started back in Jerusalem, less than 100 years earlier, probably just... Uh, Time-wise, probably about 60 years earlier. These churches had the right founder. They were founded on Jesus Christ. They, had the, they were founded in the right place. And they had the right time. They weren't founded later on in history, but they were related to the church in Jerusalem and they had the right doctrine. You see, there was a reproduction that took place. The church at Jerusalem, which Jesus started, founded the church at Antioch, out of which came uh, the church of Ephesus, out of which came all of these churches in Asia. Four generations of church reproduction. And for all of their problems, we still find the Lord in the midst of those churches. I find that an amazing thing. It just tells us of his love for the church, that he is there in the midst. And that's good to know because there is no perfect church. Bible Baptist Church is not perfect. We strive to be perfect. We strive to follow the word of God. But one preacher is, uh, said years ago, he said, I'm looking for the perfect church. And someone said, well, don't show up because you'll just make it imperfect <laughs> the moment you step in the doors. Now, we don't take that as an excuse to do what we want, of course, but uh, we need to realise that. And yet the Lord was present there in the midst of these seven churches. And the reason is because he loves his churches. He had a message for them. The Lord speaks to his churches. That's why if you're not here, you're not going to hear what God is saying to the church. And so he speaks to his churches, but his love for us will cause him to act. Look at verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. And a church will receive the chastening and the rebuke of God's word when it begins to drift. Whether it repents or not is up to the church. But uh, this is what we see. Now what was the problem with the Laodicean church? Well, verse number 15 says, I know thy works... That's interesting. God knows what we do. The Lord does. That thou art neither cold nor hot. I word that thou art cold and hot. I call this the church that made God sick. Verse 16. So then, because thou art lukewarm, I will spew thee, and neither cold nor hot I will spew thee out of my mouth. It's interesting that Christ would prefer a cold church to a lukewarm church. In verse 15, he said, uh, I would that thou wert cold or hot. Now, the church at Sardis was cold. It was cadaverous. It was like a dead body. The church at Philadelphia was hot. Even though it was a small church, it was uh, suffering a lot for the Lord but God had set before that church an open door. I'm glad God has put open doors before Bible Baptist Church. It shows that God still wants to work through us and use us, and, and yet, uh, hot or cold, <laughs> Jesus said, I'd rather you were one or the other than being lukewarm. You know what it's like to drink a cold Coke, or a warm Coke, I should say, or a cold cup of coffee? <laughs> Uh, some of us will tolerate that, but most of the time we, we'd spit it out. And uh, I appreciate the testimony of Brother Elias. He kind of stole half my message here. <laughs> that's all right. That's all right, because that's the challenge we need. Are we hot today? Are we on fire for the Lord? Are we zealous? Or are we cold like a dead fish? Or are we in between and making God sick? This is a time for each of us to look in our own hearts and to think about how we relate to the Lord. 
Well, what is the nature of lukewarmness? What is it that causes this? In verse 17, I think we have the answer. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Four key symptoms here of being lukewarm. Number one, a lack of dependence. I have need of nothing. That's a dangerous place to be, beloved. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. We can get results, but what we need is fruit, fruit that will remain. And that only comes from the Lord working in and through us. But when we get to the place where we think we've got it made, where we've got this Christianity nailed down and we can just do it alone, we don't really need the Lord, we don't need to pray to him, we don't need his power upon us, that's going to cause lukewarmness. Number two, a lack of suffering. Jesus said, I counsel thee to buy, this is verse 18, I counsel thee to buy one, uh, buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. Sometimes we just don't want to suffer, we want an easy life. Um, for most of us, you know what suffering is? Having to get out of bed a little earlier on Sunday. <laughs> I mean, we know nothing of the extreme physical sufferings and the mental sufferings of those who have stood for the faith. Yet we gripe and complain and make excuses why we can't do things. And, you know, the Lord said, you need to buy of me gold tried in the fire. And that reminds us of 1 Peter 5, uh, chapter 1, I should say, and verse 7, that, that the trial of your faith is like the purifying of gold. God wants to try us and make us better. And, and, and this church said, <laughs> we don't want God to really do anything. We'll just go through the motions, but don't speak to me, Lord. Don't change my life. Don't get a hold of my heart. Jesus said, that's what you need. A lack of purity. He talked about the shame of thy nakedness. And uh, There was a lack of holy living. People just didn't really care about pleasing God, the way they would uh, conduct their lives, the way they would speak, uh, their outward appearance, the things that they did, the things that they didn't do. We live in a world that really puts the pressure on us to conform to the world. The Bible says, be ye not conformed to the world, but be conformed to the will of Christ. But lukewarmness will kind of go along with the flow and just... uh, have enough Christianity to hold us together and a lack of vision the Lord said you need to anoint your eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see we're lukewarm when we don't care for souls because Jesus said lift up your eyes and look on the fields and they're white already to harvest and it's something that we all have to deal with don't we because we rub shoulders with people and Many times we don't even think about they're a soul that's going to spend eternity somewhere. And we need to see them as God sees them. And when we get lukewarm, we lose that zeal. We lose that uh, insight as to the true conditions of men. What this really means is being independent from God. If we were to summarize the church at Laodicea, It got itself to a position where it just really could function without the Lord having to do anything. And I'll say that's the wrong kind of independent Baptist. We are independent because we don't belong to any human organization, but we are very much dependent upon the word of God and Jesus Christ. And their problem perhaps was materialism. In chapter 3, verse 8, they said, well, uh, chapter 3 and verse number 8 says uh, uh, to the church at Philadelphia, uh, I know thy works. Behold, I've set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Chapter 2 and verse number 9, the church at Smyrna, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but then in parentheses, God says, but thou art rich. Thou art rich. We measure our wealth not by 
material things, but by our walk with God and our relationship with God. It's like Proverbs chapter 30, verse 8 and 9 said, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. Well, in a spiritual sense, we as a church need to depend upon the Lord. We can lose the wonder of our salvation. Look back, if you will, to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32. There's a good example of this. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse number 9, God is addressing Israel and all the things that God did for them, bringing them out of Egypt and the bondage of sin, saving them through the blood and through the power of the, uh, the rod that parted the, uh, the Red Sea. And in verse 9 of Deuteronomy 32, for the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the waste howling wilderness, he led him about, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye, as an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. So the Lord alone did lead him. And there was no strange God with him. He made him to ride on the high places of the earth that he might eat the increase of the fields and he, might, and he made him to suck honey out of, of the rock out, and oil out of the flinty rock. Butter of kine and milk of sheep and the fat of lambs with fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan and goats with the fat of kidneys of wheat and thou didst drink the pure blood of the grape. God had blessed Israel abundantly and they were enjoying God's blessings in their life. But what happened? Same thing that happened to the church at Laodicea, verse 15. But Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat and art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God, which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. You know, when you get away from the Lord you lightly esteem the rock of your salvation, right? That's what happens. You backslide, God doesn't mean a whole lot to you. And you need to get right with God because he does so much for us. This church had become independent of God. And, you know, there's always a danger for Bible Baptist Church in this area because we are blessed materially. We have property, we have buildings, we have money in the bank, we have a whole lot of things for which we thank God, but we need to be careful that we don't say, well, we don't need God. Thank you, Lord. You know, I've been to other countries where uh, they don't have the comforts that we have. Last Sunday, we are in a probably a 15 or 20 foot by 20 foot room made of concrete had one of the most wonderful church meetings I've ever experienced in the Philippines. It wasn't much, the seats were hard, and uh, all of those conveniences that we kind of enjoy here weren't available, but I'll tell you what, uh, it was a great time. Same thing in Mexico and Fiji and so forth. Today, many wouldn't come to Bible Baptist Church if we didn't have padded pews and air conditioning and a nursery and all of the things that are provided, and I'm glad we do because uh, it helps us, I guess. But we need to be reminded that these things are good, but they're to be used for the God's purpose, to win souls, to make disciples, and to glorify the Lord. And that we have one task that's been given to us as a church, that is to go into all the world and preach the gospel. We need to be a soul-winning church. Keep the main thing the main thing. And so this was the problem here with the church of the Laodiceans, by the way, notice that it's called that. In the others, it's the church in Ephesus, the church in Thyatira and so forth, but this is the church of the Laodiceans. It's like they'd taken over and said, Lord, you can knock on the door, but this is our church. There's also a danger for you and your Christian life because complacency is a dangerous thing. Living in the comfort zone, there's a song we have in our hymn books and it needs to be sung with great care. 
Glory, hallelujah, I shall not be moved. <laughs> you know, there's needs all around our church, things to do. But some of you won't budge. You just want to sit there, you say, that's, you know, I'll come to church, that's my blessing. Uh, well, I'm glad that you're here, but uh, don't have the attitude, I, you know, nothing's going to move me. Nothing's going to move me. When we measure our spirituality by our material blessings, God has been good to us, praise the Lord. We want to thank the Lord for everything he's done for us. None of us are in the abject poverty. Um, but Paul was never satisfied with himself. He said in Philippians chapter 3, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling. Paul was always pressing on, pressing on, wanting God to bless more and more. Don't ever become satisfied in your Christian life. And say, well, I've, I've reached a stopping point. And it may not be the best, but it's not the worst. And so I'm happy to be mediocre. I'm happy to be lukewarm. We need to guard against that. Because a lukewarm church will start with lukewarm members. Are you lukewarm today as you look into your own heart? Neither cold nor hot. Jesus warned us in Matthew 24, 12, he said, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Christians can become cold, callous, uncaring. What we need is to have the fire of God in our hearts. Remember those two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and they were talking with Jesus, and they didn't realize who he was until he broke bread, and then he disappeared, and in Luke 24, 32, they said, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened unto us the scriptures? And I think that really ought to be how we receive the word of God, that it, it just sets a fire in our heart because the Lord is talking to us along the way. We don't see him, but he speaks to us through his word and the spirit of God ministers that word to our heart and gives it to us and we have a fire we ought to leave with a fire was there a time in your christian life when you were more zealous than you are today when you were more committed or more sacrificial or more faithful you know he said in verse 15 to this church i know thy works and i'll tell you god knows exactly what you are doing what you're about how you're thinking and how you're acting. We can fool others, we can put on a front, but God knows what's going on in your life. So what's the cure for lukewarmness? lukewarmness? Well, this church at Laodicea didn't make it because at some point in history, the Lord removed the candlestick. I don't know a lot about the history of the church there, I know it doesn't exist today. I've been to that location in Turkey. It's called Pamukkale. And uh, it's a very interesting place, but there's no Baptist church there anymore. So somewhere along the way, the Lord removed the candlestick, as he did actually with the other seven churches. They no longer exist. But with these, this church could have gone back to its purpose. And how do we know that? Well, in verse 19... The Lord says, be zealous, therefore, and repent. And if we are lukewarm in your, if you are lukewarm in your Christian life today, you don't have to say, well, I can't help it and nothing can, nothing can be done. God can get a hold of your heart. You can be zealous if you repent. Repent means a change of mind that leads to a change of action. Lord, today I recognize that I am lukewarm, I am uncommitted, I, I am not where I once was and I know that is wrong and I, I come to you for the fire that I need and I'm repenting. That means you change things. You've got to make steps. You can't just sit there and say, well, that's me, but that's nothing much I can do about it. In fact, the Lord uh, spoke to many of these churches and told them they better repent. He said to the church at Ephesus, remember from whence thou art fallen and repent. He said to the church at Pergamos, repent or else. 
And to the church at Thyatira, he said, you better hold fast to the truth. The church at Sardis, remember, hold fast and repent. And so the message really is, if you are lukewarm today, you can do something about it. Repent. Repent. Doesn't mean getting saved again. I know repentance is part of salvation and repentance and faith in Jesus Christ is how we are saved. But as Christians, there's a need to repent. And what does God prescribe? Well, invite Jesus Christ back into the church. If the church is lukewarm, verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. (laughs) Imagine the the Lord outside this building down there knocking and saying, is there any usher that will open the door? Anyone will open the door and let me into this church? But it applies to our life as well because it's addressed, he says, if any man, if any man hear my voice. So, It's talking about your life uh, and if you need to have a personal walk with the Lord restored then you need to open the door and say, Lord, come back. Uh, Don't leave me. Don't stand out there but come back and let me live for you. Seek true riches. Gold tried in the fire, verse 18. Seek righteousness. White raiment. Seek God's vision. Help me to see things in the right perspective. Verse 18, we are living in what a lot of people refer to as a Laodicean age. And yes, we are, but it's not the first time. It's, and uh, throughout history, there have been these compromises that have led to churches that have been lukewarm and God has been sick. He's, they've made God sick. Now, that's a negative thing. Let me be positive, and I want to thank God for the many faithful churches that there still are, many faithful preachers, many faithful brethren. I I had the privilege of being around a lot of them this last couple of weeks, and uh, some of these Filipino pastors are just outstanding men of God, and I was just so blessed to be there. And I know in our own country, You know, we can look at the news and we can think this place is falling apart. And in many ways it is, but I tell you, there's still a lot of good good God's people in good churches and preachers who are standing for the truth. We ought to be thankful for that. But we ought to say, well, let's make sure we're doing the same thing. Because the warning is for us as a church, but it's also for us as as a Christian. Because verse 22 says, he that hath an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Are you listening today? Are you listening to what the Spirit of God says? You know, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And our church is only as strong as the weakest member. And yes, when you get saved, you're not a strong Christian. We understand that, but you're supposed to grow. And I hope that you are growing. Growing is a thing that goes on for the rest of our life. We'll never arrive fully there until we cross the finish line and enter heaven's glory. And then we'll know everything. Today we look through a a glass darkly (laughs) and we see what God has revealed to us in his word, but there's one day we'll have it all. But until then, we need to be faithful.